Okay, everybody, so I'm super pleased because it's a brand new show, brand new episode, and I'm more than happy uh, to, to welcome our dear friend uh, Jimmy Neko to open the show. Thank you, Jimmy, for be being like a bit the godfather of the show, if I can say. Um, well, thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. I, I mean, yeah, everybody is, is going to be pleased, and we are like beyond pleased to have you in the, in the show for the first episode because the funny thing we were talking about that earlier a few days ago but um I, I'm, my my store manager and business partner is is telling me about Jimmy Neko's music for years and um it's it's I mean I'm so happy to have you for the first episode because it he recalled me uh you know two days ago like oh do you remember he was playing in New York I think you you were playing in New York in 2018 January or March something like that Maybe it's one of the numerous shows you, you played there. And we were leaving New York for, to, to LA in the guitar trip we were doing. And we missed you by one day. And it was like this in Nashville. And it was like this in New York. And he just recalled me this like two days ago. So finally, we cyber meet each other. But thank you again for being part of, of the first show. My pleasure. So, um, I mean, I just wanted everybody to you know, through the, the Matt's Guitar Shop Instagram and the Matt's video cast, you know, to discover your music. And uh, because a lot of artists we're working with are like, well, you have to listen to Jimmy and Echo, you have to listen to Jimmy and Echo, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I, I, we, we said like, okay, for the first episode, people have, if it's not the case already, people have to discover you. So, I mean, can you tell us about the numerous things you, you, you've done in the past? Because that's quite you know impressive man oh <laughs> well where to begin it's been a it's been a long road already um yeah. a good one though a good one a really rewarding one and um we've gotten the chance to do some really wonderful things and meet some great people and travel the world and play a lot um i was blessed When I was 23 years old, I signed a record deal at DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. I make music under the name Ours, O-U-R-S. And I've been doing that since 1992. Um, around 1997, I signed with DreamWorks. And so, um, you know, some people look at it like, uh, you know, you sign a record deal and then everything is... Yeah, it starts. Yeah, it's a... Um, you know, fantasy that everything is immediately great. That's just, it, you know, it can be, it's, it's the beginning of things potentially being great and, and being given the opportunity to get your music um, recorded and out to the world and um, have, have the, the chances to, um, you know. Um, yeah, maybe to tour and to meet people and to, to have a, like a bigger network and to, to have people discover your music, which is like every artist's dream, finally. Absolutely. Yeah. But for me, it, you know, and I, and I think it should be like this with anyone, um, that, was just, that was just the beginning because the, the, um, the end goal was to make music that I believed in and that I, I could stand by and, and then, you know, that's, that's the challenging part, holding on to your identity and your integrity through all of it as when you sign on with a big machine like that, you know, it's, there can be forces that, you know, kind of push you this way or that way. So um, I held on, I did, I did my part and I held on and I, I made the music that I wanted to make. I'd say 90 something percent of the time, almost a hundred percent because there were, yeah. Just those little moments where, um, you know, you would bend a little bit here or there as an exercise yeah. for the label so that you weren't, you know, so that I wasn't being so um, closed off. So you, you know, you do an exercise here or there and that's okay. I don't mind doing that to, um, you know, you can grow, you can grow a lot doing that. So I never minded to do the exercise, but every once in a while, once you did the exercise, um, the 
public's perception could be that that's what you are, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, if they if you catch it in a moment where you were you were taking that chance and doing something a, a little bit outside of what you would have normally done, but I, I can say for the most part, um, yeah, yeah, I was able pretty to pretty appeal to to have done it. <laughs> yeah. So and that took that took um, me and the band, the different people in the band through the years. It, it took us all over the world, and um, yeah. yeah. Which is finally one of the best thing that that could happen because that's such a thing, you know, to to start from, you know, where where, where you come from originally, when when those hours come from, uh, in, in which part of the U.S. Uh, we're from northern New Jersey, right right on the border of New York City. Okay. So so that's where I grew up my whole life, right, just looking out my window at New York City. That's a nice view. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but that's such a thing, you know, to have, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're big fan here of, of your music and especially, you know, what uh, the, I think some people even don't realize that the, the such the influence that you had on, on younger generation, we were speaking, uh, you know, earlier uh, when, when we first talked a few days ago, like I was in the studio with, um, my friend, my friends from Paramore and uh, my, my, my buddy Max, you know, started talking about you like he's doing in every place he goes. <laughs> and he, he, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, but Jimmy Nico, they were singing your song with like the full console with the full vo volume and like it was crazy. And um, it's amazing. And that's why, you know, we really wanted you on, on the show because to see the influence that you have on that generation. So how do you feel about having such an impact musically talking with bands like, you know, Paramore and big, big bands like that, that are major touring bands today? That, I mean, that's quite blessing, right? What a blessing, yeah. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, accept that sometimes because it's, it is so, it is so rewarding, you know? Mm -hmm. to know that just um because i am i am first and foremost a music fan myself and i will always be i think when you stop being a music fan of other people's music and what other people can do and you get too consumed in in your own thing i think you stop growing then yeah so um i've always been very vocal about being um in love with other people's music and never ever felt any weakness in giving praise to to others um, that are out there, whether it was before me or currently at that time. Um, so to know that that I'm having that influence on anybody is really, it's great for me. Yeah, it's, it's very moving. Yeah, because it's huge. I mean, there were, when they started speaking about you at that precise moment, it was like, Full hour speaking about what you've done and the career and the, that 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 was quite amazing for me too because I discovered your music by by you know this day too so uh, that, I mean and on your end what are your influences what which artists um, when you know we all have um, that in music industry we will have someone that we are really fan of and on your end what was the day. You know when you listen to music a precise artist and it pushed the button you know in the in your brain to say like wow i don't know what i'm doing but i want to do that later you know <laughs> yeah um early on for me it was um basically like elvis presley and john lennon when i was really young you know i i grew up and i have really i grew up um i, I guess you could say mostly in the 80s but I was born in the 70s and I have really strong memories of 1978 and 79, 1980 of the music at that time. Mm -hmm. And we, we traveled a lot as a family together. Um, we spent a lot of time in, in the car, putting a lot of, of miles on, you know? Mm -hmm. So the radio was always on and, and at that time the radio was really a wonderful thing you know it brought us so many great songs and great artists um i just couldn't get enough of it you know just like anybody that has that feeling you know you don't know if 
if you're fully capable of reproducing that or giving it back to the world, but you, you know, we're definitely changed by it. So um, early on, so many people, whether it was at that time, you know, um, a lot of the solo Beatles stuff, a yeah. lot of the 70s um, ballads and the melodrama of the 70s. Um, you know, everyone from Air Supply to John Denver to George Harrison. Um, Bowie, Bowie was really, really always, for as long as I remember, from the beginning right to the end with his last record, Black Star. Probably yeah. one of the biggest um, impacts on me was David Bowie, just because of um, ever-changing, just true artistry. You yeah. know, it was clear that he was, he just followed what he was inspired to do. Yeah. And so. And the way, the way it was, you know, even creating the character, you know, in the seventies and later, like becoming him, you know, finally that, that, yeah. that, yeah, it was, there was, he's part of, you know, those artists like, like Prince and Michael Jackson, and there, there is a before and after. I, I saw you, by the way, covering, uh, you know, Prince song, uh, today on Instagram, I was, you know, uh, swiping your, your, your wall and I was like, wow, you know, that was pretty good job you, because you did it really on your hand finally. Yeah, yeah. Um, Prince, just Michael, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, mm. um, all of them such a huge impact on me. Diana Ross, um, Commodores, um, Four tops, all of that stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, but that's such a cool thing to see. Where do you come from? And uh, what I especially loved when we were talking the other day was like you told me that finally you don't you have you don't have like a precise idea of where you're heading when you're entering in the studio when you creating music, and you have several projects that we are going to speak about, um, you know, in, in a few and. Uh, I just love the way you, you said, like, you know, I don't know what I'm really heading to, but uh, as long, you know, I, as I'm creating, as I'm writing the music, I just, I just do it and it goes there or there. And I, then you choose a project that the song was, uh, you know, that fits the song finally. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of was my original idea about ours. When, when I was younger, I played around with a group of people and as like young, young men, we played a lot for about five years through New Jersey and New York a lot. We, we played almost every night, Any, anywhere we can play, we would play, whether there were gonna be three people there or, or you know, a few hundred or whatever it was, or nobody. We took the show and we played as much as we could and became a, a strong band. Um, but I felt like we, we took that as far as we could at that point for what I wanted to do, which was um, basically not, not follow any one particular mm -hmm. genre or, or direction. And um, I just wanted to, I want, the thing that I wanted to be consistent was an emotion through the songs. And that emotion, the best way that I could put it was that it was just, um, part of the, a natural part of the human condition. Um, I just wanted that to be present in every song. Um, expressing, expressing joy was the most difficult at that point in life. When I first started out playing, I was, it was more easy for me to, to play some things that were a, a little more joyful and maybe things that I would be smiling through while singing yeah. because that it was natural to do that. I, I grew up loving, loving um, Olivia Newton-John. Yeah. So okay. uh, just the way that you could, you could like hear her smiling when, exactly. she, when she sang certain things. Yeah. And um, I just loved that. So early on, I was very influenced by that. And I had 
more of that in the music. But as the years went on, I went through my my teenage years, and I wasn't I wasn't so happy anymore during during those times. It became more about a different kind of search for me and trying to find some some answers beyond just basic um, the basic kinds of emotions or things that we were we were touching upon and going through. I just needed to myself to do some some searching and put that into the music. So, um, but it's tricky because I, when I made my first record, Distorted Lullabies, we were, we were coming out of the grunge time. And though it, you know, with each, each new phase, um, you know, kind of had a bit of where it came from, but then made something new with it. So whether it was, you know, things changing over from uh, Queen and Zeppelin to those then 80s kinds of bands, which many were super, super talented, but it got a little, it got a little too overdone. Yeah. And, you know, people kind of taking a bit of that there's still, you know, in, in my opinion, there's still a bit of the 80s and those kinds of guitar players in in those, a lot of those grunge bands. It's just that they were, they kind of were dressing differently and at that point and not celebrating Hairspray so much, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But all very, very talented um, people who could play coming out of through the 80s those guys could play and sing the singers were great there wasn't any faking it yeah exactly like, like through the last i'd say definitely the last 20 years easily of um kind of just about anybody could sing on on a record you know just because of the of autotune and stuff yeah sure yeah but that that's i mean it's such amazing to see from where do you come from like you you are in because what I understand now is like you depending the what you were living and the the childhood time the teenagers time and and maybe the adult uh, time you know that finally you you mix that in in your own song because when you when we listen to to you we can even if we don't know it comes from you we can even think that maybe that's another band or another artist, you know, you have your vocal signature, of course, but the, the song range and the musical range is such, you know, large that, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's such a thing that uh, very few artists have, in my opinion, this, they have their own signature thing, but you do have your vocal signature thing keeping like a large, uh, you know, and, and many uh, style of music finally. So that's, that's really amazing. So it's great to understand from your influences. Yeah, I just, I just had it all mixed in there, you know, from, from James Brown to Olivia Newton-John to Sarah McLaughlin, yeah. Katie Lang to Bowie and Lennon. I just, I loved so much of it. And yeah, I, I could never um, specifically nail down one approach to say okay we're going to be a blues band mm -hmm. or we're going to be a rock band or it just I, I would get too i would get too bored even singing the song i get yeah. too bored so i have to kind of make sure that i'm being um fully expressive for everything that is inside of me you know and that's just that's what happens that's just what comes out so you know, sometimes it feels like it would be better as far as success goes to to limit myself to just doing one thing so that people would understand it. Um, but I, I'm I'm here for the long haul, not for the yeah. immediate overnight. So that, I, you know, we we might have some fun here and there, different projects to say, OK, this is going to be straight up a rock and roll band and and that kind of thing um in the future we may do some things like that but but not in ours ours is supposed to be wide open no no borders no borders you know that it's we're equally as connected to um in my opinion to israel or to 
Egypt or to Japan. Um, Speak to everybody. France. France. It's, it's, yeah, my, my head is so open about it. My heart is so open to, to all of it and being connected to everyone that I, it would be so weird to me. I <laughs> love American music, classic American music country. Um, some of the old songs, I, I really, really love it. But to just be that is so so odd. Yeah, yeah. You it it was it would be like you you were feel you you would feel that you were missing a part of the world that needs to be discovered maybe, musically yeah. talking. Yeah. And so and do you have like because I saw on Instagram and I think uh, people are going to, to you know to to listen to your music and I just saw that you released uh, something uh, you know and you posted something that you're going to post on platforms and and you know um streaming platform maybe and uh, oh, oh can we listen to the new the new thing because we were talking it was like a trilogy or something that that you were that you're doing for a while and uh, finally people were excited to see like the special post i think it was for halloween right yeah yeah so uh so, so i mean that can you so that that thing is a, is a special hippie with uh, six songs six complete new songs Yeah, they're, they're, they're five complete new songs. Five complete new songs, yeah. Um, so let's see if, if I can explain this, if this makes sense to anybody. If yeah. you're willing to, uh, to um, take the ride with me right now while I explain this. Um, over 10 years ago, I set out to just come into the studio and start to record. I had a few hundred songs, and the idea was just start to record and see um see what i what i'm feeling inspired by see what's working for me or what isn't working and so what started to happen was there were a handful of songs that felt more more raw and youthful again they had this youthful kind of energy about them um a kind of revisit to the way that I felt a few years before Disorder Lullabies. So my thought was, well, how could I, how could I make this music and put it out without people necessarily feeling, again, it was, it was more of like creating almost uh, like a story and a play because if, if I was to just keep going, um, building on a, a certain sound, Um, production wise and, and continuing for that to grow um, that would be a, a certain kind of music that I would make because I, I had done some th things that had a lot of production and a lot of um, just big sounding things um, if I was going to build upon that and do it I would have to do it really well mm -hmm. and you know that It, it's time consuming. It takes a lot out of my brain to, to do that. So in the meantime, sometimes I want to just put out something really raw uh, because it's, it's just, it's quicker and it's just kind of raw, raw yeah, emotion. The, yeah. The, 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 your, your, you know, natural idea and what, what it came from really. Yeah. Yeah. To make, you know, different kinds of records with all the production, it just takes a lot more out of you. So, Basically, I, I just got this idea that I would make almost like a, it would be like a three record story about um, almost in music, mirroring, mirroring what I actually had gone through in life through my process. So I would, I would have to go not, you know, not to like make it so self-focused but I thought that it was an interesting um, journey and everybody had been telling me for the longest time because of what the the road that I was traveling and, and the struggles that they saw everybody kept saying oh you should you know you should write a book you have so many stories and yeah. I, just, I just felt like well maybe maybe one day but in the meantime maybe I'm going to tell that story um, with with audio, with, with songs. So that was the idea. So I set out 
with this idea of, of ballet the boxer would be the first record yeah. and then new, new age heroin would be the second and then spectacular sight would be the third which would talk about in a sense um it is it is mirroring my experience but it's it's kind of telling the story of the first first act in life for me and anybody you know you go through a whole thing and then life changes and you have a, a decision to make do i continue on that path or do i do something new in this next act and i chose to to jump back in and make more, more music so my thought was to um to go back and make boxer like this youthful sounding raw um not very polished yeah sounding record um and then so that would kind of tell the story for me in my youth before the sort of lullabies when i had um a bit more angst in me and not necessarily the um the maturity or the or the, the coping tools to to get through it so it was more of a thing when you're younger like that you kind of um looking to fight your way out of everything physically yeah. punch your way through things um at least how i was raised that's what happened you know because i was i was pushed around a lot and bullied a lot through life so eventually i got to the point where i just wanted to punch my way out yeah yeah that's and, why oh. that was that was the your way to uh to like have a yeah it's not you didn't write a book finally you just write songs to to It's a it's a teaser of maybe for the upcoming book maybe in a few years. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. Just here it was, it was was the this was the way the music sounded to me at that time. This was the feeling of it, and um, because the story of lullabies when that happened, I had already basically abandoned an entire feeling and sound of music that some people had grown to like that was coming from me. It was very wound up and yeah. and full of that. So. Um, by the story of lullabies, I had, my son was born and I completely changed my life and I was a different person, not overnight, but I did, I did about seven years of working on myself, mm -hmm. really, really working on myself and looking in the mirror and trying to be good to myself and trying to be good to everyone else and doing my best to live my life um lead by example for my ch my child at that point and then eventually my children i felt like i couldn't tell them to do one thing while i was doing another thing mm -hmm. so i i had to really you know examine myself and look in the mirror and in that time uh, basically it just changed my entire existence from being um a young angry kid at that point i wasn't always that way i was i was i was not angry at all when i was younger but then through high school through a series of just you know the way that things were it 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 kind of wore me down and and made me a little callous you know so um my son and then daughter basically healed that in me and so the sort of lullabies was full of hope even though there, there may have been some darkness to it um I think overall the record was full of hope and love and that's where my heart was um truly it wasn't an act to for any reason i wasn't selling kindness i wasn't preaching kindness or selling charity or anything like that i was truly in that space and the music reflects that um so to go back It wasn't very healthy for me to tell you the truth to go back and do something like I imagine you. <laughs> I, I don't I didn't want to revisit that person at all but it was this time I was more so standing on the outside looking in and and almost taking on this that persona so yeah. that happened then the second record's new age heroine yeah I knew that new age heroine was going to be a very sad um pretty record and I, I had these songs that were really 
heavy and to me some of the best songs that I had ever written so from a songwriter standpoint I felt like that was I was progressing naturally in that without thinking about making the trilogy as a songwriter I felt like I was that was true progress for me but my challenge was that I had just put out a solo record not long before that also with these more sad type acoustic songs that I also felt wasn't very naturally where I was at that time mm -hmm. so my my problem was that I, I just I couldn't stop writing these sad songs because that's that's where I was for such a long period of time and to be honest you know I, I had to do that so what I started to do is write songs um, imagining that I was in a really great space and that I was happy and um, as a way to try to heal myself again of, of just some, you know, some more life that had happened in those years. So New Age Heroin became this, to me, the record that I was most proud of to date at that point. Okay, great. Um, mm. For real, it wasn't, I felt like I finished it from top to bottom. I, I, I had complete um, ability and time to do whatever I wanted to, but my concern was that I had to, kind of, left it out that I was going to go basically and make this next record where where I left off with say elements of distorted lullabies and mercy these big lush production songs and a lot of energy I, I had kind of given the impression that that's where I was going mm -hmm. so to get to the spectacular site I just felt like well, this is really where we're at now. We, we got to this magnificent, exciting place. We really did with an entire new group of people that, um, you know, we, we basically had to start over and I had to um, dig deep within myself, find out where I needed to be and where I wanted to be. And then we built we built another band like we were 18 years old and we put the time in like a real, real unit. Um, and um, so that took time to do that. So, so in the meantime, what we did was we put New Age Heroin out, but I didn't make much of a deal about it. I didn't want to promote it or hype it up, even yeah. though I was so proud of it. Finally, really proud of something that I was putting out, but I, I didn't want to I just didn't want to hype it up. It's a big thing because I remember, you know, the the, the day you released it, um, and and my friend Max came came to my place and he said, "Oh yeah, I just released New Age Ring. You gotta listen to it." Uh, and I was like searching even on on the internet, and it was like such a secret thing that your your fans were more than aware of. <laughs> but for for us, uh, you know the world and the, the people that didn't have the chance to, to have access to that, you know, we were like, oh yeah, yeah. So, you know, I just listened to it and I was like, wow. And this is what actually, what personally brought me in your music, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, for me, New Age Heroin kind of has the whole spectrum in a sense of what I had been doing up to that point, you know, with the, I play some songs uh, just live with a, with a piano and I sing two songs on the record a live vocal piano and yeah. that's and that's that um, and um, you know then some of the other songs kind of dove pretty deep into that emotional space you know like mm -hmm. a song like New Age Heroin or My Love um, and then had a blast with things like Fly and Pain Aside they've become a huge part of what we do now for our our set things like fly and paint aside new age heroin it's um there's so much a part of what we do it's there's this thing in my head where this it answers the question like what did what was missing the whole time like why what was going on like why why wasn't it catching on per se for everyone and I know for me personally that there have been these elements missing. So we put New Age Heroin out. We didn't make a deal of it. More time went by. Yeah. It was taking me longer to finish this record. 
the election and everything was happening, I had these yeah. songs from, I had some of those songs from about six or seven years ago. They weren't specifically to do with the election. They were just about what I had seen already as a problem boiling up in, here in the United States long before um, Trump was elected. I had seen this underbelly of, of a mindset that I felt to be problematic. We traveled around the country a lot and we just saw this a certain thing going on, going way, way back um, to it's like 97 to where we started to tour and we felt, wow, this, this is still the way people think. There's, mm -hmm. there's a real problem. So I had taken it on myself in whatever ways that I did artistically, which could be argued that I took the wrong approach, but I was taking my approach because I, I just, I couldn't stand to see it anymore. The, the, you know, the, the racism and the division in the country based on um, people's skin color was ridiculous to me. So mm -hmm. I've put a lot of um, life into trying to get people to wake up from that. So I felt like I was sitting on some songs that needed to be brought out right before the election. Uh, so we, yes, that's the point we're talking about. So we dropped Media Age just as we did New Age Heroin overnight, basically. Um, not any promotion, not any buildup, not any hype, just get it into the hands of people and hope that they are moved by it and they're enjoying it. And there, as, as you see, there's not a great effort spent on my part or our part, um, promoting ourselves, spending the time promoting ourselves. It's more for me been about just really making the music and getting the music done. Mm -hmm. And then in hopes that if people like it, they'll tell other people about it and share it. But it's, I don't have the time to, on a daily basis, just, you know, do things. Yeah, just like, show people what I was eating for. And that's why know, I'm thankful again, because or, you're spending quite, quite, quite some time talking about your music and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy doing it. And uh, so that I, I just, I just also have one thing, few, few guitar question thing for the, like the, the geeks that are going to watch this too, because actually I got that thing here over there. And uh, I, I, ha I had to buy that in LA. Love it. It's your fault if I got it today because if I if I'm right, that's a '67. But if I'm right, you got the same one from '68. That's a yeah. B25 Gibson. That can can you tell us? I mean, do you got that with you or? <laughs> wow, man! <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the first one in the world. Somebody, you know, each side of the screen has a B25. <laughs> Yeah, I may have tried to get that guitar at one point. Oh yeah, I mean, good luck because Max would kill me if I if I sell it to you. But I, as I told you, you know, it's yours whenever you you are in Europe. So, uh, what's the story with your B twenty five? Because that's such a thing that, I mean, they they're great guitars, and we were talking about you know even the Cortez or the Texan Epiphone from the sixties. But they are not so, in, I mean, in the guitar world, they're not so popular, but they're such great songwriting guitars. And so what, what's the story with yours? How did you find it? And, you know, because I, that's, for me, the iconic Jimmy Neko guitar. You know? <laughs> well, I was, I had before then, when I went into um, Make the Story of Lullabies, I was very fortunate to have, um, the budget to get any guitar that I wanted, really. And so this was going to be the time that I, I went and got, you know, maybe a $10,000 J200 or an old Martin or something like that. And I went into Rudy's music in Manhattan. And I, I, I told the guy, I said, look, what's the best guitar that you have here? The warmest and the and the one that plays the best. Um, I said, budget doesn't matter, whatever it is. And he, he basically handed me this Collings guitar. And I played, I thought it was gonna be a Martin, like I said, that I was gonna walk out with. 
and I love Martins, that's why, but um, I love the old Gibsons as well. So to be handed this Collings I never heard of, I was like, ah, a little skeptical. <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna spend a chunk of money on a Collings today, but I, I played it and clearly right away, I said, you're right. This, I, I hear an organ in it when you play, you know, when you play anything, you, it's like, literally like you're being accompanied with with an organ or something and so that became my studio guitar and i did um you know the story of lullabies with that and um eventually i do precious with that as well that's that now in my texan are what i i really take out when it's time to get serious about the acoustic guitars mm -hmm. in, a, in a big way, you know, big warm way. But as far as being on the road, you know, um, vanity, I suppose, <laughs> I, I needed a black guitar. Okay, right. So I had, before that I had an Everly um, that I, I really liked. It was, you know, it was, it was bigger. And had with the two yeah. guards on it, and uh... yeah, and it had the stars down the neck, and it was really pretty. Um, but it was a reissue, mm -hmm. and um, there's just something about the reissue that is it wasn't it wasn't the real thing, you know. Yeah. So, so I, talking, you miss something sometimes. Something it was cold. Yeah. yeah. So I toured for a bit with that, and we went through Chicago, and I went to the Chicago. Um, music exchange there and I had gotten a few guitars from them each time through town I would see something and get it and so it was just luck I went in I saw that um, I, I immediately stopped and I said what's that guitar because um, I bought a bunch for a while I was buying a bunch um, and I played it immediately fell in love with it immediately at right then and there had him put a pickup in it for me he changed um yours probably still has the wooden saddle there mm -hmm. okay um, they, yeah they come with the wooden adjustable yeah. but for the pickup he had to change it um gotcha. so i wasn't thrilled about that right away but he he promised me that that's what he needed to do so we did that, um, and um, shortly after that, um, I was in Los Angeles with my my friend um, Zoe Bonham, um, mm -hmm. um, and we were at this music store, and, and my friend that that was working there was telling me about these these pegs here. Yeah. Um, that are ivory and I know it's not very nice and it's probably illegal yeah. now and I'm it's sorry really if I've <laughs> yeah I'm sorry if I've contributed to yeah. to anything um, harmful towards elephants because that's that's not okay but they were there she bought them for me as a gift I I put them in the guitar is just nothing like it for me I I use it um, I just, there wasn't a place I would go for almost the last 20 years now without it. Just, mm -hmm. it's become such a, a part of my body. It's, mm -hmm. it's the most natural thing to play. It's, it's small, as you know, it's tiny. Yeah. Uh, so it's easier to play. The, the other guitars I have, you have to really work them. Mm -hmm. um, like I've played when Johnny Cash passed away and I was, I was by Rick Rubin's house and, um, Rick was bringing out these Martins one after another, and he said, "Here, play this. This is Johnny's." And and it was so difficult to play. Yeah, you got to um, fight with him. Yeah, really fight. And you know, Johnny must have these big hands or something. Um, I have kind of big hands, but I'm just a tiny person. So um, this guitar just works really well for me, and it's easy to play, and I can play um, at times more like what I would play on an electric. Mm -hmm. uh, on the acoustic it's easier for me yet it doesn't sound um 
it doesn't sound cheap or not like a real good like a real acoustic guitar some i had a few other smaller body ones and they didn't they didn't do the same thing so this was kind of i think maybe my third one that's like a small body and so i was skeptical when i saw it i said ah it's gonna be like another l i forget what they are l0 l1 whatever you know yeah those yeah. Are, yeah but but it wasn't and i, I want another one like i need another one <laughs> <laughs> this is the your I, I I'm introducing that to everybody. This is your Europe touring guitar. <laughs> Whenever you need to. But and we by the way, we hope to to see you, you know, in Europe anytime soon after the crisis, the sanitary crisis hands. You know, we we're hosting like a show called Mads Guitar Session, and I would be more than thrilled to to have you on board, you know. And uh, that's I and I just I just I, I, I mean, I'm telling that to everybody out there that they're missing something if they're not listening to, to, to like the, I mean, all your discography is such a thing. And um, I'm, I'm quite happy that we approached in this interview, like the, the sequences of your life, because then we, we get to, to understand, you know, your feelings when you were going into the studio and when you were picking up a guitar and the, and you know, sometimes the, the, the unrageous thing that went hot from, from there, and sometimes the, the you know the most quiet things that, that you, you released as well. But and but I you know I think the 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 way that it, it tends sometimes to something super personal in your way uh, is is just super important as a as an artist because you you still have like since you you were saying like you close to 30 years you know you you're doing that for close to 30 years and you still have your thing which is uh, not the case of many many even super successful artists so uh, i'm glad we approached that life sequence then that you went through you know good good yeah it's a lot to to, to think about it for somebody to follow along with but um for anybody who's interested that's kind of the story so well, that's um, amazing you know people i think people want actually um, you know either way the, the people who, who already know you or people who are going to discover you through this you know that i think it's always very important to see uh, not especially an artist but especially uh, what you know people in general are, are coming from because then you get to to get that uh, empathy that and you understand them so that's uh, that's such a, a good thing that we we approach that, you know. So uh, I'm a, I'm again super thankful because I, I just can't wait to see you over here, um, you know. I, and um, our, our common friend Damien, who arranged this interview, you know, was, was telling me that, you know, missing a, a Jimmy Nichols show is some just a shameful thing. But uh, you know, we we missed you twice in the U.S. So uh, we need to organize like a session here and uh, organize the yeah. show, you know. Yeah, I was before everything hit with this uh, pandemic, and Damien and I were were trying to plan. I want to come out there for a month and stay and play, um, and play every week or, or a couple times a week. Um, find find the the spots and play. Um, I'm going to do that, so I'm going to commit to doing that. As soon as everything's better, I will I will be in france for a, about a month that's amazing you know that's that's the the really good news of this interview <laughs> finally and so so for again for people who are going to 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 watch that so the, the, this is the 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 final uh, album of the trilogy that uh, finally people can can listen to uh, i mean spotify or, or the streaming um, or do you have to get through your your system your website the final one is not out yet. Um, yeah. So that's what happened. I forgot to mention that. So Media Age, what, yeah. what ended up happening was that from this jump from Boxer to New Age Heroin to Spectacular Sight, I realized that there were these kind of little EPs in between that would connect them. So Media Age is like two and a, or part 2.5. Okay. And then there's going to be another, there's going to be another one after Boxer that we'll put out sometime next year after Spectacular Sight that will be called The Fall. Okay. So, so there's Ballet of the Boxer, 
the fall, new age heroin, media age, spectacular sight. So there'll be five in total, but three full length and two five song EPs. Wow, that's great. So when, when can, so you just released media age. Uh, media that, age. And yeah. So where, where can we, you know, for people who, who didn't know the project and where, where can we listen that? Can we listen that to the streaming platform or do we have to, to get your on, on Bandcamp. Okay. Yeah. Bandcamp there. And um, I, th I think it just came out on iTunes as well. Okay. We'll put the links in, you know, in there, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. It just, it just a few days ago came out on iTunes. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that was a good surprise on Halloween. I was like, I was following you on Instagram and I I, I was, I saw like I maybe two, three days before Halloween, you said, hey guys, I got a surprise for you. So we we were like, okay, what's what's this? We were, you know, we were um, hoping that it was a few new songs and uh, we, we were super thrilled to, to, to hear them and everybody should hear them. So, uh, so that's, we are going to put that the link we we can see that on the video, but the link are there, and the uh, and um, the album will be will be there, you know, because it's such a great hardcore. Did you did you do that by, by your, yourself as well? The the few past hard work, especially in your age heroin, which which was quite um, quite a stunning front cover, you know. So uh, did you draw that? Are you a drawer? Uh, no, um, April in the band. April plays piano in the band and you know, sings and plays keyboard and stuff. She does the artwork. Wow, nice. Congrats to her because they look they look amazing. So yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. She did a good job. Um, but as far as recording it and producing it, mixing it, I, I basically have done that. I've played a lot um, of the instruments, but I've also had great um, contribution from and the band and from some of the people that have once played with us. So when, where it was, you know, where there was a little hole and somebody was hearing something, we made it a big hole and let them really jump into it. So, um, but we've basically taken this on ourselves um, financially, the, all of the work, we've just, it's all in house. We just do it ourselves now. So it's a lot, it's a lot, especially, especially, you know, I'll, I'll say this, but I don't, I don't tune vocals I, as when I'm doing our records or anybody else's records, I will not tune a vocal. Um, it's just not, that's just not, that's not a record. If you're tuning a vocal, that's not who you are. It's not the reality. Um, so, and, and it's fine, I'm sure you know, there's a lot of great records out there with tuned vocals, but um, it's really blurred the, the lines of, um, in my opinion, of truth and what, um, what the artists are selling to people. Sure, you know, every, look, everybody wants it to be great. We all want it to be great. We want to sound great. Yeah. And in many cases, it's not necessarily the artists fault because they're making records with people and then the producers are just tuning it or you know the labels having them tune it to make it sound great um but that's not that's not okay with me so uh, it, it takes sometimes a while i do a lot of the background vocals as well i do have um some people that jump on backgrounds with me when when we want a, a different sound april sings as well and um, two of the guys in the band sing, Mikey and Chris, they both sing. That's very helpful. Um, I have Hannah, who I've told you about, who sings a lot with me. So we've really been able to, to do a lot uh, more with harmony and things like that. But I, I end up doing a lot of them myself as well. So constantly just really locking in, getting them locked in, not tuning at all you know, over the, the course of trying to record 200 songs where I'm tracking everything, I'm the engineer and I have to treat all the sounds and mix everything while getting all the vocal takes and all that. It's, it's just endless amount of work that's, that's gone on for the last almost decade now. But it is, it's over a decade technically because I started, yeah. And if I think about Mercy and all that time that I did all those as well here. Um, but 
as far as in me recording it and having to do that, it's been about a decade. Wow, that's a, that that's a complete complete job that you're doing for for like everything. You <laughs> yeah. people have to realize the why, you know. <laughs> it's too much, but uh, this it's what happened when I made a decision not to be on a label anymore, mm -hmm. not to take money from anybody. Um, I will. I, my mindset was. I want to make the music that I want to make the end. I want to own it. I want to own my masters. And if I can make music that's um, great, that people want to license, then we, we can talk about licensing and stuff. But in the meantime, I just wanted to, you know, yeah. wants to do it and own it. And um, so that's, that's part of the deal. That's what it takes. So course yeah but uh, f finally we we i i mean i will again put the the, the album here uh and uh, the the hippie and uh, we are presently waiting for you know the the, the final uh, the final release of of uh, of the trilogy and uh, i really hope that everybody is going to you know to have a chance to see you guys uh, and i'm talking about you and i'm talking about all the artists in that are stuck, you know, in uh, in their places yeah. around the world. And uh, I, I thank you again, truly, for being part, you know, the, the first episode um, of of the the Mads video cast. And I mean, uh, thanks, thanks again. And I can't wait to to really see you over here performing. That that will be uh, my first time, and we can't wait. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, yeah. I, I can't wait to get over there and, and spend some time. I promise, I promise I will. I'm, I'm looking forward to it so much. So thank you. But th thanks again, Jimmy. And uh, we all wish you a wonderful day. And uh, I hope everybody can uh, listen to your music as they should for anytime soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for being part of it. Sure. Cheers, brother. Guys, I just hope you enjoyed the very first episode of Matt's video cast with our friend Jimmy Neko, and he's going to play some music for you. He's going to play a classic of one of his most famous songs, and he's going to play New Age Rain for us with his Gibson B25, an iconic Gibson B25 that Jimmy is playing for years, and you just heard the story in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to Matt's Guitar Shop TV on YouTube. We're going to have some amazing guests in the next few episodes. We're going to have Smashing Pumpkins, Dave or Driver. We're going to have some guys from Gibson uh, themselves, you know? So um, some amazing guests that you just, you just have to be there. So uh, thank you for following us. Thank you for following Matt's Guitar Shop on Instagram. Thank you for all the support you guys are making. Uh, we are just, you know, we're just one. And thank you for being part of it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And here is Jimmy Neko for you now. Cheers.
did my best to live each moment like the next won't come Forgive the worst and see the best in everyone But there is trouble when you can't look in their eyes I'm only moving towards a feeling that is right is right Keep moving
some kind of new age heroin in love forever you will be in love So I pray some more stability and I pray some kind of understanding. You are the one who fills the emptiness inside me. So I pray as I listen to your heart. I pray. So I pray as I listen to your heart. I pray.